Hi, I'm Howard Nima of We Are Change Connecticut and Truth Talk News on TruthBroadcastNetwork.com. My good friend Jeff at We Are Change Connecticut uh, conducted an interview with Susan Lindauer, uh, a CIA asset who was imprisoned for speaking the truth about 9-11. Great work, Jeff, great work. Please stay tuned for this important interview. All right, this is Jeff Durkin here. We are Change Connecticut. We're here with a wonderful whistleblower who did a f great presentation on about her story, about her story as a CIA asset, and her whistleblowing involved with 9-11 um, and different events like that. And we're here with Susan Lindauer, the whistleblower. So we're proud to have her. So Susan, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you very much. It was a great audience tonight. So just for any new viewers out there, introduce yourself, your background, how you got involved with it, your information. Just try to go through as much as you can. <laughs> uh, I was the CIA asset covering Iraq and Libya at the United Nations from 1995 until the Iraq War in 2003. And I... Also, I, I worked in anti-terrorism as a specialty and we developed a peace option for Iraq that would have made the whole conflict avoidable. Uh, we also gave advance warning about 9-11. And so when the government decided they wanted to lie to the people about everything uh, and create a phony justification for war, the phony argument about weapons of mass destruction, um, I was removed. I was definitely in the way. Uh, I was very outspoken against the war and I was subsequently arrested on the Patriot Act and locked up in prison on Carswell Air Force Base while the government rewrote the history books. So definitely, and try to get more of the background into it, um, your story, you mentioned the involvement of Andy Card, um, your relation to him and all that and the different aspects of that, if you could go into detail with that. Sure. Uh, my cousin was the chief of staff to George Bush, Andrew Card, who leaned into the, uh, who whispered into George Bush's ear on the morning of 9-11 that the second plane had struck the World Trade Center. And George Bush responded that he uh, had seen a video of the first airplane striking the towers before he entered the classroom and that he thought it was a lousy pilot. And by doing that, he has admitted um, advanced knowledge of 9-11. So what do you think you talked about the different um, the warnings you put out months before 9-11? And tell the viewers out there, anybody else, how far was it before 9-11 that you knew um, the plot and all that stuff? I learned about 9-11 from my CIA handler in April of 2001. I was summoned to his office with, an, with a demand that he had a message to deliver to the Iraqi embassy in New York. And he wanted me to tell them that we were seeking I intelligence on airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center specifically. And that if Iraq possessed this information and failed to give it to us, that would be a... Uh, result in a pounding uh, beating that they had never, like they'd never taken before. And the, the, the tragedy was that when I went up to the Iraqis, they immediately responded they would be happy to help us. Uh, they had already agreed to allow the FBI to send a task force into Iraq with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations and make arrests. And they said, go ahead and send the FBI if you think there's an attack coming. But the whole point of Washington, so that's another area of severe passivity on Washington's part, where they wanted to attack Iraq and then the, the Iraqis deftly avoided, deftly solved the problem um, and neutralized the threat, but it was Washington's refusal to act mm -hmm. that results in this, this tragedy. Over and over and over again, uh, you see that there's a deliberate refusal to make decisions that will solve that will stop 9-11 and it's an active participation it's it's not it's not a passive passivity it is it is an active collaboration with the planning of the attack and then of course we had the peace option on the table uh, that that it was weapons inspections uh, the FBI task force there was also special contracts for American corporations we could have had everything we wanted the CIA was very demanding in what they expected Iraq to give them it went way beyond the official UN 
uh, Security Council resolutions. Uh, we wanted uh, priority contracts for American corporations in telecommunications, healthcare, hospital equipment, transportation. Iraq offered to buy one million American manufactured automobiles every year for 10 years. And I laughed. And they said, well, how about 20 years? And I said, no. Ten years will be fine. Um, they offered special preferential contracts in oil. They offered at one point, right before the war, to give us the Luke Oil contract from Russia and to take Russia's contracts away from them and give them to U.S. companies. And that wasn't enough to satisfy the greed of the United States. Tell us your involvement now when you go towards Iraq more with Libya and your involvement with that um Go before the invasion and all that stuff going on right now. Tell us your background on, on Libya. Uh, I was involved in the Lockerbie negotiations for the trial, the handover of the two Libyans. Uh, my CIA handler was in Lebanon during the hostage crisis in the 1980s, and he was on the ground when Lockerbie was under was planned. The bombing of Pan Am 103 was planned. And that was involved, uh, the CIA was had infiltrated heroin trafficking out of the Bekaa Valley and they were taking a profit that cut of the profits big time cuts making bill, you know millions and millions of dollars personally profiteering as well as financing the black ops and so the defense intelligence agency team accused the CIA of having a rogue agent who was double crossing them every time they'd close in on the hostages they the double agent was allegedly re reporting it to the uh, to the Hezbollah the Islamic jihad and so the hostages would be moved so the defense intelligence agency called out an investigation from Washington and those guys came out and they got heroin they got money they got documentation they were all flying back to Washington on Pan Am 103 the morning that it that it crashed when it blew up out of the sky and it and when they died when all those people died it killed off all knowledge of the heroin trafficking out of the as well and the CIA's role in heroin so now once we're talking about more about Iran and all that and the escalation, whether it's going to happen or not with World War III with Iran or not, based on, um, would you agree probably, uh, this is kind of a, f a funny question, but would you agree already that we're already at a covert war with Iran already based on the economic sanctions that have been going on with their nuclear program or their economy or their dollar collapsing their um, I forgot the name of their currency but something involved with that do you think it's already at war most likely but the media is not covering it that's a really good way of putting it a covert war and a proxy war I look at Syria as a proxy war because Syria has a long relationship with Iran and they are Shiite and America's allies in the Middle East are Sunnis the Saudis particularly are radical Salafists they believe in Sharia they're very deeply conservative and fundamentalist they are not moderate they are not pro-democracy and yet across the board you see the United States supporting gutter and Saudi Arabian sponsored financially sponsored revolutions in Tunisia Egypt Libya um, all of these are being are backed by the CIA and the CIA is is supporting the Arab Spring and we're providing uh, guns financing we're training them in propaganda and that's very important. The CIA is behind a lot of the anti-war propaganda, or excuse me, the, the pro-war propaganda uh, supporting the Arab Spring. So anybody else, just for any viewers out there know about, um, tell us about other whistleblowers that you know of that are doing your great work of exposing this to the world about uh, the w criminal activity going on. Any p people you know involved with whistleblowing, uh, such as yourself? Well, well, the, the, the one who, I, who breaks my heart is Bradley Manning. Uh, Bradley Manning it needs all of our support desperately. He is, I, I'm afraid that they, they've raised the expect. He, he's, okay, for those of you who don't know Bradley Manning's story, he was the young soldier who released 
the uh, security tapes to WikiLeaks, which Julian Assange published. But he also released videotape of war crimes by American soldiers in Iraq. And he was accused of aiding and abetting the enemy, which is a, a serious punishable offense and treason with a possible life sentence. My fear is that they've by, by threatening him with a life sentence, they're actually going to come back and hit him with a 20-year sentence or a 30-year sentence and say, oh, see, we're being generous here. We're being lenient. <laughs> and that's terrible because let me just let's put this in perspective that Lindy England, who was involved in the crimes at, of Abu Ghraib, the torture, the, the, the hideous abuses of Iraqi prisoners, she got three years in prison. She's out already. And they want to give Bradley Manning, who has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and he's been in prison 900 days with no trial. They've they've refused to give him a trial, and they've they've uh, they've held him in solitary confinement for most of that period. They subjected him to uh, every fifteen minutes. He was on a suicide watch, and and I, having been in prison myself, I can tell you that in a suicide watch, every fifteen minutes, you're required to say your name or say uh, answer a question, so that you never fall asleep at all. You it's a, it, it produces a. a, 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 a uh, an Torture. induced psychosis state, psychotic state. Um, I, the reason my story was kept quiet was that I was arrested on the Patriot Act and thrown in prison on Carswell Air Force Base. And so I actually have a lot in common with Bradley Manning. But I was held for one year. I was under indictment for five years. I was never allowed to have a trial at all. And it was only after four years under indictment after my release from prison, a year and a half after my release from prison, that I was allowed to have one morning hearing, a hearing with two witnesses. One of them was a congressional chief of staff. The other one was a university professor who confirmed that I was a, a, an, ass, a, an intelligence asset and that we did warn about 9-11 because I told private citizens about it. But... Um, I was I was accused of being incompetent. I was told that uh, uh, they they portrayed me as a religious maniac. Though I do believe in God, I'm not an atheist. But it's just it's just the most ridiculous argument that anybody could make if they know me. And it was not supported by any reality. But national security has it's now become about dumbing the down the population. The it's actually not to protect the, the nation's security. It's to protect congressional security, White House security. Because if the people have the facts, the people will throw these guys right out of office. It just shows, too, how the government has the war and whistleblowers going even more, taking it to the next level every year, regardless who's in office, whether it's Bradley Manning or Sybil Edmonds, even the FBI translator, and such as yourself, and many different other whistleblowers who are coming out and exposing the truth because... You, you, people like you yourself should be rewarded for all this stuff, and it shows how the government treats people when they have a conscience and speak out against crimes or a particular attack that you've known months before 9-11 and knew exactly what was going to happen. No good deed goes unpunished in Washington. That's Count on it. <laughs> Just to wrap it up here, tell us about your new book and um, what it exposes in that book or uh, more of the background to that and how the name, how you got the name for that book. Uh, my book is Extreme Prejudice, the terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 in Iraq. And it's really cool. It goes inside the Iraqi embassy and prison on a Texas military base. And that's uh, its insight to Iraqi pre-war intelligence that you would never, never expect. And it proves that there's never a time when diplomacy cannot achieve results, even in situations that appear hopeless. Uh, we can still uh, solve these problems. And I'm absolutely convinced we can stop a war with Iran. And it shows that 9-11, how 9-11 was used in a real sense to create the war with Iraq and all the steps that, that were taken to uh, the, the, the easy protocols that were ignored, that were, that were, stop, that were stopped. 
in order to guarantee that this this war could be an implemented. And, and it's important because today we're looking at war with Iran, and my CIA contacts are telling me that we expect more false flag operations. Absolutely. Because that's how they know they can drive us into this war. That we They know we don't want to go. They we're going to go kicking and screaming all the way. But what they'll do is they'll create se- probably several uh, escalating threats, strikes again and again and again to drive us into this so that we feel compelled and, and, and hopeless. So, Just as one last positive message, all this, um, not really negativity, but it's all about the truth. We know that, so we can't put a past sell on truth. But just as inspiration, what you mentioned before, that great message. I don't want to paraphrase. I don't want to butcher it. So I will, I will let you explain it, that great message you mentioned to thinking that people out there it's negative or not but we still have hope in beating and defeating whatever the enemy is or any of that just just tell us what you mentioned tonight listen we can do this we absolutely can there's so much power in our uh in our movement in in in, in, the 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 people uh You have to cut this a little bit. <laughs> I have to cut this a little bit. Um, the, the, there's the, the people do have power. We are not a, in a hopeless situation. Uh, simply by standing up and refusing to be ignorant, by letting them know we're not fooled, that false flag operations won't work on us anymore, that we're not duped. Uh, that makes it much harder for them to get away with this. And really, the military does not want to fight this war. The intelligence community does not want to fight this war, and the people don't want to fight it. So we have we have powerful allies if we reach across the table and help each other. All right, thank you, Susan, very much. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much for that incredible uh, uh, interview, Jeff. You are just doing amazing work, Jeff Durkin. We are Change Connecticut. All right, I'm Howard Nima of We Are Change Connecticut and Truth Talk News on TruthBroadcastNetwork.com, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, every night. Tune in.